good morning and good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we welcome you to the first of the three in the series of uh, November Dialogues. It's a very interesting, exciting moment for all of us at the Climate Heritage Network. And we welcome you all with a very warm heart uh, to this event. This dialogue showcases the role arts, culture, and heritage can play in achieving a zero carbon, climate resilient world for the Asia Pacific region. It's one of the three November dialogues organized this week by the Climate Heritage Network in collaboration with UNFCC. And the other two are aimed at Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and the third one for the Americas. This event forms part of the high level climate champions race to zero November dialogues. The dialogues aim to mobilize support for race to zero and its 10 climate action pathways in advance of the 2021 UN climate summit in Glasgow, which is called COP26. This event is part of the resilience pathway. This represents one of the first time uh, the cultural dimensions of climate change will have been formally highlighted in a program like this and is a breaking through moment. We thank the UN high level champions, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz for their commitment to seeing the cultural dimensions of climate change are not forgotten. In fact, they are brought right in front at the core of the discussion. This program is also part of the Climate Heritage Week 2020, which runs during 16 to 22nd November. Climate Heritage Week is designed to unite all those interested in enhancing the capacity of the arts, culture, and heritage sectors to help build uh, a climate neutral and resilient world in the time of COVID-19. And you can find more on Climate Heritage Week events at www.culture crossclimate.org. Climate Heritage Network, CHN, was founded in 2019 by organizations around the world committed to enhancing the role of arts, culture, and heritage in tackling the climate emergency, and it is indeed a climate crisis. The CHN is open to government agencies, civil society, business, businesses, universities, and indigenous peoples organization. Please do take a moment, go on the website, and if you haven't yet joined, we urge you, request you to consider joining it. Now, the today's event, the theme of today's event is a culture of resilience, mobilizing arts, culture, and heritage to win the race to zero in the Asia Pacific region. It will highlight strategies for rooting resilience measures in the values, traditions, and wisdom of communities to help assure more durable outcomes it will explore how to overcome the barriers to deliver 1.5 degree pathways, especially on cities and the built environment. And the way the event is designed, it is going to be uh, three sections. There's a keynote speech, then there is a, 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 a speaker session, and then uh, the round table, and then the closing remarks. So at this moment, um, I again, thank you all very much for joining in. Myself, Naveen Fiklani, I am a conservation architect practicing and working in India and currently a principal director at the INTAC Heritage Academy, which is the National Trust in India, and also the president of a uh, newly elected president of the ECOMOS National Committee. So here we start with our exciting culture, cultural moment, which is a film, a short film, which we are uh, going to show you. It surrounds around uh, the culture and the life of tiny element rice, which is a shared culture in this part of the world. So may I request for the film to be shown, please. Thank you. Rice is treated as a key of cotton. Each festival is connected with rice cultivation. Interestingly, in the Maso society, 32 or 35 plants. All these names come from rice. In every ritual, rice is always there.
Lucian Ode, Lintango, Cota, Yakota, Plani, Blusita, Blusiscura, Plaha, Blusiscuns at Manus, Nayakota, Plain. And once we are done in the field, we store in this place called a Maiko. This canary belongs to the people of Meluri. Ra is a place where Karbi people stocking rice bundle. It's around 8 to 9 kilo after milling in our village, even from 20, 30 years before rice bundle also they're keeping. There is one variety which we call is Shpemtha, which we can keep it for 50, 60 years also. Though it is eatable, but not tasty. You won't find any taste in it. I want to to go to the house. I want to go to the house. I so I hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, moment of celebrating rice as the source of life in this part of the world. Uh, and how it is intermixed with the cultural traditions uh, and the impact of climate that it is facing. We move to our first uh, uh, session then uh, in, in terms of technical session. And we are very honored and in, indeed privileged to have uh, Dr. Sherpa, Dr. Prasan Sherpa joining us from Nepal. Dr. Sherpa is the executive director of Center for Indigenous Peoples Research and Development has been working with indigenous peoples, women, local communities for the promotion and recognition of the traditional knowledge, cultural values, and customary institutions that contributed for natural resource management, climate change resilience, and sustainable development at local, national, and global levels for more than a decade. Dr. Sherpa has obtained her PhD at the Kathmandu University in 2018 on climate change education and its interfaces with indigenous knowledge. She has already contributed more than dozens of research-based articles and book chapters in relation to the area of her interest at national and international publications. Dr. Sherpa has served to the Board of Forest Carbon Partnership Facilities, World Bank, and Board of UNREDD, representing Asia Pacific, as well as co-chair of International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, IIPFCC, and co-chair of facilitating working group of local communities and indigenous peoples platform, LCIP, of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Currently, she is a chair of specialist group on indigenous peoples customary and environmental laws and human rights, advisory of uh, CEESPIUCN, Advisory Board Member of Canada Mountain uh, Assessment, Advisory Board Member of One Ocean Hub, and Facilitating Working Group Member of LCIP UNFCC, representing Asia and the visiting faculty at Kathmandu University. I don't think we could have got anyone better who is so cued on uh, to, to the theme of this uh, event today. So I sincerely and with a warm heart welcome Dr. Pasan for her opening keynote please uh, thank you uh, thank you Nobin 
And uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the cultural heritage uh, for climate change and the UNFCC for organizing this very important uh, important event and meeting. And my great pleasure to be part of uh, this uh, uh, meeting. Um, so um, uh, I will be sharing uh, like uh, you must have had already had the different session a uh, couple of days back. However, I will be sharing more on the how indigenous peoples, uh, the, uh, the cultural uh, of indigenous people, our traditional values are uh, linked and related with the climate change and the uh, current pandemic uh, COVID. Uh, so the, uh, these are the, just the coverage that I will be dealing today in my presentation. So as we all are aware that uh, the vulnerability and the indigenous people situation now, um, as we are, uh, most of you are already uh, aware and uh, also have been working with indigenous peoples and aware about the ground reality and also the global reality that uh, almost uh, around 6% uh, of the total population of the around the world uh, uh, indigenous peoples have been a big contribution for uh, with the pool of the climate change the resilience and as well as dealing with the pandemic. So when you see the indigenous peoples population that comprise with the 6.2 of the total population, majority of the indigenous peoples are in Asia. So almost 70, more than 70% of the indigenous people around the world are in Asia. So that also makes very important that we need to deal with the issues and concerns of indigenous peoples uh, in Asia. However, majority of the indigenous peoples are uh, under the uh, severe poverty. Uh, that. Uh, majority of the indigenous people are also live in the rural area. So uh, some of the time we can see like, oh, indigenous people and the city. But when the data show, the present data show that majority more than 70% of the indigenous people still live in rural area with their customary practices, with their traditional knowledge and governance system. And the indigenous people's life expectancy is really lower, uh, almost 20 years lower than the global average of uh, uh, life expectancy of non-indigenous people. That also shows the, uh, the situation, why it is very important to deal with the situation of the indigenous peoples uh, around the world. So uh, we all are familiar that the impacts of climate change is happening in our day-to-day -day life. The climate change impact is not the imaginary or not the unreal, unreal world. It's a real, it's a reality. Just give us some examples in the context of Nepal that, uh, you know, most of the, uh, you can see all these small, uh, uh, small uh, glaciers in the mountains, the red spots that is already at the state of the uh, bursting state of in the context of Nepal that has already have a very uh, big impacts for the indigenous peoples. So indigenous peoples in the context of Nepal, majority of them are in the mountain area, almost 18 indigenous groups are there. Now the, the research and the finding already comes up that uh, all the glaciers are in the state of bursting, or the ice are melting in the Himalayas, and the rises of the temperature is high in the Himalayas. So that also shows how vulnerable indigenous peoples to the impacts of climate change. So the impacts of climate change is not only in the livelihoods, but if you see that the impacts of climate change is hitting hardly in the cultural, spiritual, our traditional livelihoods, that has been contributing as a pool of climate change resilience for generation. Now you can see some uh, the, uh, the houses in the in Mustang in one of the indigenous groups in Nepal. Now because of the uh, changes of the precipitation patterns, now uh, uh, the the changes in the uh, the snowfall patterns, the all the roof are trying to be covered with the tin roofs now. The, the in the middle you can see the money, the spiritual size, the water resources is drying out. And then the people are really at the state of a uh, uh, state of presentation. Okay, and then the, if you see, here, let's sit down. Okay. Okay. So if you see here, uh, my apology, I have <laughs> uh, twin daughters, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's okay. It's just keep, mm -hmm. keep quiet. So if you see, like uh, you know, the study and the different study already shows that you know, including the IPCC, that. Uh, Indigenous peoples, despite being forefront to the impacts of climate change, they have a big contribution for climate change adaptation and mitigation. They uh, have uh, the ten percent of the indigenous peoples territory that are legally recognized by the uh, government or the laws have already contribution of more than eighty percent of the biodiversity. 
However, if you see the ground reality, the situation, despite there being uh, like a low carbon footprint to the impacts of climate change, there are the more uh, impacts of climate change. Now the impacts has been doubled because of the COVID pandemic. So if you see here, now I'll go back to the, you know, how our customer institution, our cultural values, traditional practices has been a pool of resilience to deal with the pandemic and also dealing with the climate change. You know, the majority of the customer institutions, majority, most of the customer institutions, uh, you know, that is related with the uh, forest and the governance system have contributed for uh, protection of the natural resources and the ecosystem and the biodiversity. And that has been a pool of the, uh, you know, uh, the resilience to the impacts of climate change as well as dealing with the pandemic. However, if you see here that, uh, you know, uh, in the context of Nepal, there are so many different, uh, there are so many different kind of uh, traditional customer institution like Nawaz in Sherpas, you know, Ghapo in Dolpo and Dititi. And there are so many different customer institution that has been a role of playing a role of the pools of the climate change resilience. Sorry, please. <laughs> and then also this, uh, and then this is the challenge as a mom, you know, dealing with the, you know, you have to deal with the children and dealing with all things, everything. But anyway, I don't know where is the papa, so papa is not being responsible. <laughs> okay, and then the, when you see like, uh, you know, um, so the richness of the diversity, cultural diversity uh, that has been depicted, reflected in terms of festival, ritual, ceremonies, and that has really contributed as a, a pool of climate change resilience. And this is just the examples like uh, that where we have been working that a small number of indigenous people, you know, like uh, through the customary governance system that has a culture of the resilience has been reflected on the grounds to deal with the pandemic and even dealing with the climate change and dealing with the protection of the natural resources, especially water resources and herbal medicines and healing practices you know, uh, that has been uh, already there and also protecting the neighborhoods, providing the water resources and even the uh, supply of the uh, medicinal plants. So another example is this one that, uh, you know, the second tradition is another indigenous groups in, uh, in Nepal that uh, culture of resilience has been playing a big role that with the, with the principle of nonviolence and principle that has been contributed for, uh, you know, not only for the uh, protection of natural resources, but also the healing practices, usual herbal medicines, and that they have also called the AMG healers, the AMG traditional healers called AMG. And that has been giving a medical treatment to any kind of medical treatment, including even the bandage, if you have broken your legs. And then also they have our own way of tradition of culture exchange of the food. If you have, if you grow rice, you, 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 if you grow like a maize, or if you grow some vegetable, there's an exchange of the cultural accents and also supporting each other during the festival, ritual, any kind of ceremony that has actually working like a, you know, pool of resilience to deal with this, any kind of pandemic or situation or climate change crisis in the happening. And this is another, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, my, actually I have also recently worked with uh, uh, another research on the uh, impacts of the pandemic on the indigenous peoples. My study also shows that I, I work, uh, my, my study also shows that, you know, in the, in the community where indigenous peoples are given their rights, the rights of continuation of the traditional knowledge governance system and their practices, they are more in good shape to deal with the pandemic, including the COVID-19. You know, they have their own way of living. They have a traditional healing practices and then they, you know, they have been protecting their communities in isolation and also stories of exchange of the rice and the fish in the current community among the Northern and the Southern is a one way of a resilience to deal with the pandemic. Market is stopped, you know, capitalist world is stopped but the indigenous people's life is continued. That also shows how important it is to have a indigenous people's rights to be uh, you know, in, in place if you want 
to continue the pull of the resilience to the impacts of climate change, even the COVID. But however, the most in indigenous peoples are more suffering to the impacts of climate change in the places where there are no land security, where there's no recognition of the cultural values and practices. And that are the one that has been hit by the impacts of climate change because no job in the city, no job in the foreign employment, and no permission to continue the traditional livelihoods in their natural resources in governance systems in their own territories. So this is another uh, very recent data uh, I depicted from RRI Right Resource Initiative in 2020. Actually, uh, this is the uh, uh, first time uh, sharing of the uh, uh, the findings of the research where I was moderating that session. I was lucky to be happy, lucky to be there to moderate the session on the impacts of the climate change and impacts of the climate change uh, uh, with the indigenous peoples. Uh, that one. So if you see the, the recent data shows also the climate crisis is happening, it's getting worse. Biodiversity in decline and lands, lands are being degraded and COVID is a consequence of the continued environmental degradation and exploitation. But in most of the South and Southeast Asia region, the conservation strategy is a weakening our, uh, our cultural resilience to deal with the pandemic and the COVID. If you see here, uh, as you are, um, um, uh, you know, uh, aware that you know our our way of natural resource governance system that is strictly managed, displacing indigenous peoples and local communities from the homeland, and you know ac restricting access to the resources has been a really, really causes of the conflicts in in numbers of the conservation area. Now there was the abuse of the human rights, fundamental human rights of indigenous peoples to continue for their customary governance and the traditional practices despite there are no, so many legal you know, recognition agreement convention to protect the indigenous people knowledge system, their values and customary practices. So this is just an example. Actually, this is part of my research, my recent research that I did for the World Bank, that uh, you know the UNESCO World Heritage, so-called UNESCO World Heritage and Culture in you know, a Chito National Park, the Chepang, one of the most uh, you know marginalized indigenous community in Nepal, are becoming homeless during the pandemics because just only because they want to continue their traditional livelihoods on in their ancestral lands. This is the same another examples in the pandemic when we are in isolation when you are dealing with the COVID pandemic when you are trying to cope with the uh, you know natural disasters just only because fishing in the Chiton National Park the Chiton uh, the Chepang community who have been in that before the establishment of the National Park you know uh, they have been uh, you know, detached from the continuation of their traditional practices, even for fishing or collecting the, uh, you know, herbs and the uh, and the resources. And the the, the community, the uh, Rajkumar Chepang, the boy, little boy, you can see in the front, he was beaten to death, and uh, you know, left with the homeless, uh, uh, homeless because their houses are burned, and homeless family with their widow and the children and the mother. So this also shows that uh, you know. Uh, like uh, when you deal with this uh, pandemic, uh, when you deal with this, uh, you know, the trend of uh, conservation of natural resource governance from more, more like, uh, you know, by detaching the rights of the indigenous peoples to continue their traditional livelihoods, the consequences we can see even in the pandemic. And then uh, the, the, this slides, I really, uh, you know, always um, uh, part of my interest to uh, understand uh, myself and also to share with you that, you know, we have so much knowledge, the wealth of knowledge is within our community, with the indigenous group, local people, we have a lot of knowledge, even IPCC had already acknowledged, however, the acknowledge of this knowledge and acknowledge of this contribution is hardly there by the legal, uh, legal provisions and programs and practices. So, you know, like a principle of and Iming is there. We always seek knowledge outside and try to see the solution of climate change even the pandemic when we have so much knowledge inside within ourselves. And because the indigenous people or member of the local community are highly considered as the you know the um, as the persons to be in the uh, engaged in the policy discourse or the uh, or the any academic or strategic development to deal with the pandemic or the climate change. 
So uh, almost I'm almost at the end of my presentation. That uh, that is why you know if you want to recognize the you know uh, if you want to deal with a pandemic or climate change or any kind of uh, anarchy or the disasters, it is very urgent to uh, recognition of the land tenure security of the indigenous peoples to deal with the climate or the COVID or any kind of crisis or to revive the culture of resilience. That uh, RRI report again. I use the RRI report uh, that I have been close, working very closely with RRI. That uh, you know, indigenous peoples are impacts of the climate change now with the COVID, and because one of the main causes I have also shown in my earlier presentation that because of the lack of the land tenure security, the land tenure rise. So consequently, the challenges has been continued despite the guardian of the world's tropical forests and biodiversity uh, to deal with the pandemic or the climate change crisis. So that is why it's very urgent that uh, recognition of customary governance institutions that had contributed for the climate change resilience even to deal with the pandemic. So the global efforts is there that uh, as I uh, also part of the uh, global efforts to deal with the deal with the climate change. Finally, the global uh, efforts has been there to uh, three function of the uh, you know, uh, local communities and indigenous people platform to knowledge capacity building and climate change policy and action that to be replicated on the grounds with the uh, in uh, both uh, bilateral uh, with the uh, you know the in collaboration coordination with both uh, constituent bodies inside and outside the bodies and I believe like cultural heritage network is outside the bodies and I know and you we have been working together to deal with this uh, climate change issues and concerns with this. I would like to uh, um, conclude my presentation and I would be happy to respond to any queries if you have. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yeah, my apology with the daughter's <laughs> disturbance. Yeah. Sorry, no. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sherpa. Uh, and absolutely no uh, need to uh, express your apology. This is all part of life. And, you know, it has shown that, uh, in fact, it is good that we are uh, now able to have keynote addresses and formal speeches with our kids around, with our children around. That's part of, uh, you know, a very important part of our lives. So absolutely um, no need for any apologies. You are great. Uh, we will now move on to our next uh, speaker, His, ex His Excellency uh, Ambassador Leon Feber from the Asia Europe Foundation. Uh, welcome, uh, Ambassador Faber. We are hugely honored to have you at this event. Ambassador Faber joined the Asia Europe Foundation as its eighth Deputy Executive Director on September 1st, 2020. Uh, he is a seasoned career diplomat with nearly 30 years of experience. His previous postings include being head of mission, European Union delegation to the Lao PDR. Deputy Secretary General, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Luxembourg, charged the affairs of Luxembourg uh, Embassy in Hanoi. He has worked in the areas of human rights, health and humanitarian affairs, and he has more than 20 years of experience in development cooperation. He received his MA in uh, Sinology, Classical and Modern Chinese uh, Philology, and European history from the University of Treves, Germany, 1989. He has studied at the University of Fudan, Shanghai, 1983-85, the University of Heidelberg, 1981-83, and the University of Luxembourg, 1980-81. Ambassador Feber has always had a great interest in intercultural dialogue uh, that he is happy to bring into his current position. He's married with two children, and we are very happy, uh, Ambassador, that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to be able to join us at this event. And the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your kind uh, presentation uh, of myself. And uh, I'm, of course, very happy uh, to be here uh, today with my team from uh, Azef. And I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Sherpa for her lively presentation that uh, was uh, very knowledgeable and uh, also uh, in interesting. And especially I, I, for me also in the context of the COVID, if I may just say that, I think the, uh, the biodiversity uh, issue is extremely important. And I 
coming from Laos also, I, this was something that we, we tried to work on and also raise awareness about that. But um, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy uh, to join uh, you all here today for this important um, conversation on the role of uh, arts, culture and heritage, and what they play in achieving climate resilient uh, world. This is an area that uh, Azef has been working on since 2007. And today I would like to share with you some of the ways we have gone about doing this and what we have learned in the process. So please allow me to start by briefly introducing uh, the Asia Europe Foundation, ASEF. Uh, ASEF has been uh, in the business of funding and facilitating a multicultural cooperation since 1997. Uh, our aim is to build long-term alliances between civil societies in across Asia and Europe based on fair exchanges and mutual respect. So over the past 23 years, we have brought together uh, more than 40,000 professionals and students from the two continents. Culture, education and sustainable developments have always been a priority for us. Um, as you may know, our work is publicly funded uh, by 51 countries, as well as the European Union and the ASEAN Secretariat. And together, these uh, 53 partners make up the Asia Europe meeting ASEM, that uh, is an informal political dialogue process that set up the Asia Europe Foundation. So since 2007, the Asia Europe Foundation has been working on uh, foregrounding the role of arts, culture and heritage uh, and how it can play uh, in achieving a climate resilient world. So there are several reasons why uh, we started out in this direction of linking culture and climate change. Around 2006, we were beginning to notice the emergence of climate change as a topic that artists were beginning to engage with more and more in their works. At the same time, uh, the debates that had begun about uh, the instrumentalization of the arts for climate change advocacy. So, our first inquiry was to know more exactly uh, how cultural practitioners wanted to engage with, climate, uh, with the climate change debate. So, uh, secondly, we noticed uh, the problem of silos. So even where artists were involved in the climate conversations, they were often doing so among themselves without ever talking to scientists, activists, business or policymakers. So we strongly felt this in 2009 in Copenhagen at the COP15, um, where ASAF organized uh, side events with artists. So the physical zoning in Copenhagen created a defined area for the arts, a separate area uh, for the activists, and yet another one for the businesses. This led us to reflect on the disjoint environment created within the climate change conversations taking place. So very often, the arts and culture sector were relegated to adding color and personality whilst being sidetracked in the real conversation with policymakers and businesses. So while we naturally felt that it was better to be present in the arena than not at all, the dilemma was very clear. Thirdly, we wanted to create a space for diverse worldviews in the conversations around sust sustainability. We were keen to bring previously invisible voices to the debate, particularly in Asia, in the Asia-Europe context. I will borrow the words of the Indian anthropologist uh, Shiv Viswanathan um, to make my point. In one of our publications, uh, Mr. Viswanathan eloquently argued that sustainability needs a theory of memory and of storytelling that allows for diversity. Art is the gift of time to the official textbook of sustainability. But time without diversity uh, would be tragic. I remember a scientist telling me that uh, India has 50,000 varieties of rice. This is also a nice reference to the, the film we have just seen, which uh, essentially means that there are 50,000 varieties of dreaming, cooking, myth-making, memory-making, and storytelling. A sustainability in uniform has no understanding of um, diversity. So the need of the hour 
is also for the interdisciplinary, multicultural, and translocal to be embedded in all actions um, being taken for building a climate resilient world. As the Belgian artist Nick Gaffney uh, shared at one of our Azef dialogues on culture and climate change, the alliances and networks that will be best equipped to deal with the current global instabilities are unexpected couplings of people with divergent interests who can work as equal partners, able to respect and learn from each other, regardless of their specific cultural, professional or social backgrounds. This is the kind of dialogue that Azaf is constantly trying to create throughout our work. So fourthly, the reasons we started to work on culture and climate change is, was about our uh, curiosity. How green was the cultural sector in its own practices and how willing to be self-critical of its failures? Even where there is information about innovative ways in which arts, culture and heritage sectors were addressing sustainability in their own practice, practices, they often came from a few countries and almost entirely from the global north. Entire universes of knowledge were missing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, these lines of inquiry have shaped the work we do over the last, or we have been doing over the last decade, particularly in arts, culture, and heritage. I would like to share with you four kinds of work we do to foreground local and alternative uh, cultural knowledge about sustainability. First, we bridge existing information gaps in the sustainability discourse. Secondly, we support artists, uh, artist led projects that investigate new and local dimensions of sustainability. Thirdly, we create spaces for dialogue col and collaboration among cultural operations in Asia and Europe around sustainability issues. And fourthly, we facilitate multi-stakeholder dialogues between governments and cultural operators around sustainability. Please allow me to share some examples of this work with you. As I said, we curate information or alternative discourses about sustainability. In 2015, we launched a green guide series for the countries we work in, titled uh, Creative Responses to Sustainability. Each guide explores in an opening essay what sustainability means to a particular country. It also maps some of the most innovative work being done by cultural organizations around climate change issues. Currently, such guides are available for Australia, Indonesia, Korea, Portugal, Singapore, and Spain. <clears throat> Excuse me. In these guides, you can read, for example, about the Varuanta Art Center in Australia, which collaborates with a team of scientists and artists on the Paruku project to explore intersections between Aboriginal knowledge systems and Western understanding of the region. Or you can discover collectives in Indonesia, such as the House of Natural Fiber and Jativangi Art Factory, who are amplifying local traditions in addressing sustainability uh, challenges. Similarly, similarly, our creative resource publication series maps craft innovations throughout sustainability, our first guide in the series, Crafting Laos and Cambodia. Here, for example, you can read about the pioneering work of Ecofibers done by Samatoa, a Cambodian non-for-profit organization. Samatoa recycles about 200 tons of lotus stems every year. In 2018, it launched Lotus Tech, a new fiber composite made of lotus stems, waste, and plastic uh, from, uh, from recycled bottles. All these resources are available on our art website, Culture360, and I invite you all to explore this information hub if you haven't done so already. I will now turn uh, to the second aspect of our work supporting artist-led projects on sustainability. An interesting example is Echolocated Littoral Lives, a marine artist residency in the Irish Sea, organized by the Media Art Research Interdisciplinary Network, Marine. This project explores uh, ecological issues posed by human impact on marine ecosystems, particularly around harbors. 
And I will now turn to a central uh, value and work, namely dialogue. At ASAP, we create neutral platforms for dialogue on equal terms among cultural operators uh, from across Asia and Europe. Within these dialogues, we embed our guiding principle of diversity, not just demographically, but in terms of worldviews as well. Currently, we are running a virtual residency for young Asian curators in partnership with the Japan Foundation. Virtual working revolves around two themes that are central to our conversations today, Asian textiles and first voices. I am light, I'm delighted that you will all have the opportunity to listen later today to one of our mentors for this residency, Professor Dr. Amaresvar Gala. He is guiding young curators on how they can centralize and valorize the first voice of the primary stakeholders as rights holders, how they can overcome the agency of authorizing and instead become listeners and enablers of indigenous voices and knowledge. Last, but certainly not least, ASAF creates platforms, uh, platforms multi-stakeholder dialogues on the role of the cultural community in the larger climate change debate. In 2014, for instance, the Asia-Europe Culture Ministers meeting hosted by the Netherlands directly addressed this issue. ASAF mapped a variety of innovative, but virtually unknown local and community practices from across Asia and Europe. We also organized a conversation among cultural operators, uh, city governments and national ministries of culture on what is needed to build sustainable cities for the future. In conclusion, I would like to say that now more than ever, we need diverse voices, traditional wisdom and local practices in the larger conversation and actions on climate change and resilience. Designing for the future, writes the Belgian artist Nick Gaffney, involves embracing forward-thinking elements of the present while being grounded in the traditions of the past. To design a more resilient, more resilient post-industrial culture, we can look at the diversity of pre-industrial and early industrial traditions in Europe and Asia, including arts and crafts, science and philosophy, hosting and storytelling, gardening and cooking, while embracing cutting edge developments in science and technology. At ASEF, we see ourselves as enablers and facilitators of uh, just such, such conversation, conversations. And we would be happy to work with like-minded organizations in the future. And please keep watching ASEF's social media channels for, open, for our open calls for collaborations of many kinds. I really thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, His Excellency. That was uh, a brilliant over, overview of the work of ASAP and its uh, you know, most stimulating engagement with the issue at hand. Uh, I have always said that ASAP is a unique organization which has got which is one uh, which has got one body but two heads. So one head looks east and the other head looks west, but it is the body and the mind that then combines the inputs from both for the most meaningful outcome. So you, 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 you are at the most critical position, uh, uh, you know, dealing with matters of both the East and the West. Um, having said that, we'll now move on to our uh, uh, next speaker who is joining us also from Singapore, Dr. Johannes uh, Vidodo. He is an associate professor, the director of NA.ARC, Masters of Arts, in Architectural Conservation Program at Tun Tan Cheng Lok Center for Asian Architectural and Urban Heritage in Malacca, Malaysia, of the Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore. He is an associate member of the Singapore Institute of Architects, the founder of MAN, Modern Asian Architecture Network, executive committee member of the Asian Academy for Heritage Management since 2019. A uh, distinguished jury member for UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Heritage Conservation, member of ECOMOS International Scientific Committee, a founding member and director of ECOMOS National Committee of Singapore and Indonesia, a founding member and director of DOCOMOMO uh, Macau and DOCOMOMO Singapore. 
the founder and executive director of INTA, International Network of Tropical Architecture. He served as an advisory board member of the preservation of sites and monuments of the National Heritage Board of Singapore 2013-19. He is a board member of SEACHA Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance Platform from since 2019. And he serves as a member of the alumni KU Leuven Regional Council Southeast Asia since 2020. Uh, Dr. Vidodo received his first professional degree in architecture from Prahayangan Catholic University, Bantung, Indonesia, 1984. Masters of Architectural Engineering from Catholic University, Leuven, Belgium, and a PhD in architecture from the University of Tokyo, Japan, in 1996. Please do pardon me for my inappropriate pronunciation of uh, some of these terms and words which are from, of a language that is not uh, my first or second or third or even tenth language. Uh, we now invite uh, Professor Vidodo for his address, please. Thank you, Navin. Well, our English is not uh, the language of uh, the, the Queen English, so we have a broken English as a language. So even pardon me for my, my accents, but uh, listening to uh, Ambassador Leon just now, um, it actually is my neighbors. It's just a few uh, steps away in the US campus. Uh, we, are talk we are listening about the, the how the framework and the institutional uh, aspect, uh, how to deal with this climate change. And it has been put up a lot with the, with the SF. And listening to, to the first speaker, Pasang, uh, is also talking about the how the we, we should see local wisdom and also within ourselves how we are dealing with all these problems that we are facing today. So in my uh, short speech um, talk this morning, I think I will focus more on the optimistic uh, positions and looking into the human capacity to survive. Um, what I mean by this uh, human capacity to survive is looking into our uh, DNA, actually, something that is already embedded within us. I will not talk about from my uh, professional perspective as an architect. Of course, I will cite some examples from architecture. But from my own experience, when I live in, uh, in, in, in a different culture in Japan, I, I spent uh, four years in Japan and then back and forth so many times. So what I wonder about this Japanese life uh, that I experience is something related to the sustainable intangible culture. You know, Japanese um, live on a very uh, dangerous land. It's part of the ring of fire. It's part of the volcanic uh, activities, the earthquakes happening uh, from time to time, sometimes three times uh, a month or even uh, I was in, in, in uh, Kyoto next to Kobe uh, one day uh, before the earthquake and also typhoon came every time. So disaster has become part and, and parcel of the Japanese life. And also looking into the architecture, they live in a traditional house with a made of, of, of timber, is not from concrete. Um, they use paper uh, and double walls. Uh, to survive, uh, sometimes it's very harsh winter. So what they are doing there is quite interesting. Within this kind of uh, limited resources, in the place that is uh, full of danger and threat of the human existence, they managed to survive uh, many generations. So this is the experience. During the winter, when the temperature drops, sometimes in several areas drop under zero, there is um, a culture of you see you wear uh, three layers of of, um, of of kimono of the Japanese uh, clothes to keep your body warm, and then the family gather around a table in the house. This is so called the kotatsu, with a cover of a thick uh, cloth, and then you eat uh, hot food, the so hot pot, 
And sometimes uh, in a certain models, you can have a table that the heat is not just above the table, but you can feel so the heat below the tables. And when you turn on the televisions or you read the manga or the comics, most of the time, the, the themes during the winter sessions is related to romantic stories, to sex, you know. So it's kind of um, trying to warm up from within. So in cultural uh, life of Japanese, everything is like come together holistically. Either it's in the food, in the clothings, in the lifestyle, in reading, in television program and everything is concept, it's a concerted effort to make the body warm so they can survive the winter. During the summer is the opposite side. So when summer comes, the temperature can raise up to 35 degrees, sometimes 40 in Tokyo. Uh, first thing that to do that people start to wear a very thin uh, yukata or very thin uh, cotton um, uh, kimono. And then they hang um, a bell, a metal bell or glass bell uh, uh, or furin uh, on the terrace. So when the wind blows, you can hear the chirping sound of the of the bells that, that cool your, your, your body psychologically. And then you eat a cold sake, uh, a lot of ice, a cold noodles. And when you turn on the televisions, read the, the mangas or the, the comics, you can find a lot of horror stories, murder, you know, scary stories to help you to chill your body during this hot summer. So with the very limited resources, with a very uh, holistic kind of, of lifestyle and, and, and cultural uh, uh, productions, you, you can feel comfortable in a very harsh situations. If you look into the, the how the Japanese uh, traditional house is designed, the room itself is very flexible. It's based on the tatami. And the tatami map typically has a 90 centimeters to 180 centimeters size. And that is actually fit into one uh, human body. So if you have a four tatami rooms, that the rooms can fit for four person. But that room can easily be configured, configured into a sleeping room during the night. So in the morning, you just uh, clean up the rooms, put all the mattress and everything into the, the, the cupboard, and then you can turn that space into a living room. And then you can also use the same space as space for dinner to receive guests and even to do a tea ceremony. So it's a, it's a matter of, of efficiency flexibility, the multi-purpose use of a very limited space. So we don't take more than what we need. We only use whatever we need, but not whatever we want. So I think I, I learned about the lessons of, of, of resilience um, from a different angle. So it's not just about the, the intangible lifestyle that we enjoy during winter and summer but also how we utilize space and how we, we maximize the, the limited resources for the benefit of our life. And if you look into the material that they choose, it fits exactly into the situations of the, uh, the, the earthquake prone uh, areas. The, the structure, the wooden structure is very flexible. So it can resist the, the the, the power of the earthquake stronger than concrete or even steel. And if the house collapse, it will not kill you immediately. Well, of course, most of the, the, the death happening during the earthquake is because of the fire, not because of the structural damage in the traditional house. But if you live in, um, in a concrete house, most likely when the house collapse and the chance of survival is, is very, very little. So in 19, in 2008, actually I was invited to, to speak in a one conference in Los Angeles uh, as part of the so-called the Sustainable Dialogues, uh, the third uh, Sustainable Dialogue in Los Angeles. That is the year after the, or two or three years after the, the great uh, Indian Ocean uh, tsunami. 
and also um, uh, after the Katrina uh, disaster in, in, in US. And during the, the uh, conference, I found out a very interesting uh, different attitude between the Asian architects who, are, who, who, who try to reconstruct Aceh, uh, Gail in Sri Lanka, or, or Phuket in Thailand, um, in, in dealing with uh, how we, with nature and disaster. In comparison with the American architects who, who try to build a stronger structure, a stronger uh, materials, uh, using technology and innovations to fight against nature. So there's in one side, there is an attitude to try to resist the, the strength of the, of the nature, while the other one is trying to follow the flow of nature. So this is two examples of, um, of image. The, the first one, resisting nature, for example, is you try to build a dam, you try to use technology so the flood will not come into your house during the flooding. But in Hoi An, for example, in central Vietnam, uh, flood comes every seasons, um, and accepting nature means that you also using architecture to adapt into this changing nature. So if you look into the shop house typology in the city of Hoi An, uh, there is no spirit wall that separating the front and the back house. There is a front door and the back door. So when the flood coming into the front door, the water will go through the house and the house safe because you don't try to resist the strength of the water. And when the flood is coming up into the streets, they just take boat and they still enjoy um, marketplace, play with the water and the economic life is not disturbed. You know, even the water puppet, the famous water puppet uh, show in, in Vietnam was invented by, by the local uh, farmers to entertain the children during a long uh, flooding seasons. So and then this uh, puppet theater, um, this uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, created a puppet theater in Hanoi just to, to say that this is um, our culture that should be uh, sit side by side with the, the Western culture. I say. But what my point is, the attitude towards nature, it can be seen as um, maybe a two different perspectives. So this is just my speculations because maybe people like with uh, uh, a Buddhist uh, or Asians, even Christian, doesn't really uh, uh, hook ourselves into the materiality. We value the, the intangible uh, values and culture as more important than the material possessions. We believe in reincarnations. We, don't, we are not afraid to death because death is just part of the new life like the symbol as the, the stupa symbol. The stupa is, is of course, it's a mound, a burial mound. But out of the stupa, there is a tree of life come out. The new life is coming from the death. And that's why we always play with nature. We feel like we are like a bamboo. Yeah? If there's a strong wind come, we just bend. But the bamboo will stand again when the, the wind is, is moving. So I think this is the key to the so-called the cultural DNA of the climate resilience. So if you look into how our attitude towards water uh, in Bangkok during the flood, uh, well, life is going on as normal. And children also playing with waters in different contexts. So I think this component of, of fun with the, the Thai uh, use the word Sanuk uh, is, is, is one of the key um, important ingredients to survive the climate change, to survive the disasters, and to keep our civilization alive uh, for the next generations. So to conclude, I think what several examples and several lessons that we learned from what, what um, just I presented just now. First is the importance of ethics uh, towards uh, our nature the ethics and also towards the, the other society. The ethics of take what you need, but not what you want, actually is very important to, 
to to help the the civilization stand out and to share whatever we have to the rest of the of the community the second is also talking about the efficiency and empathy so ethics efficiencies and empathy this is a very important attitude that we need to hold tightly that is belong to the traditional the so-called local wisdom that we already have for generation this should be preserved and then even propagated through education to the next generations and second is also the uh, ability to reflect and to see within ourselves to take everything easy to be confident to have a positive thinking or to have fun and that will make us stronger and make us optimistic to be able to survive whatever situations even in this uh, pandemic of course pandemic is a difficult situations disaster is a difficult season and climate change is even a bigger change but i think by looking into this uh, points that through educations and through our preparations to make our next generations our children generations to be ethical to be empathetic to nature and the fellow human beings that will be the key of survival of human civilizations thank you thank you uh, dr vidodo for bringing out some of the very fundamental basic elementary aspects uh, of our everyday living wisdom knowledge to be able to deal with and not only survive but look beyond the crisis that the world is facing thank you very much uh, may i request Uh, the participants to start thinking about the questions or queries that you may have and start popping them in the in the slido chat box that is open uh, for this purpose and after uh, uh, our next speaker we will open for the question a session for about 5 to 7 minutes because we are running slightly behind schedule uh, with that i would invite our next speaker uh, hataya Sri Patnakun is currently a specialist in cultural heritage conservation at Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization Regional Center for Archaeology and Fine Arts CMU SPAFA which is based in Bangkok Thailand Since 2015 she has been in charge of professional development on cultural heritage conservation for CMU SPAFA focusing on disaster risk management of cultural heritage for 11 member countries in the southeast asia through capacity building activities and researches in collaboration with other international organizations like icrom unesco etc she has also contributed as a resource person to several workshops trainings and conferences hosted by uh, south asian countries and for her 17 year experience in working at various thailand governmental agencies especially in the fine arts department ministry of culture the main thai governmental agency responsible for cultural heritage conservation she is involved and developed her conservation professional uh, network she also provided consultation and recommendation for conservation projects as well as coordinated several regional activities within the asean community recently hataya has Uh, serves as the government of thailand as an expert for thailand delegation to the world heritage committee 2019 to 2023 and as an independent consultant ms sri patnakun has worked for various landscape architectural design and conservation projects that is conservation plan for designated old towns in thailand as well as community development using participatory learning method and culture based approaches for her educational background besides a bachelor in landscape architecture uh, ms hataya also holds a masters degree in conservation studies from the university of york uk and now is a phd candidate at the chulangkom university thailand in addition she was elected ecomos board member for 2017 2020 and then appointed secretary general for ecomos thailand for 2019 and 2022 It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Ms. Hataya.
for her lecture speech, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nevin, for your uh, excellent introduction uh, to me. Uh, actually, today it's my pleasure to join uh, these remarkable and uh, very interesting events and also learn from uh, many experienced uh, individuals and experts. Uh, it's my pleasure today to share how the water management system of UTR in the past, which may contribute to make the city at present more resilient. Actually, uh, UTR is located, uh, the land that UTR is located, emerged by the impact of the environmental change in the late Holocene when it was covered by uh, sea water. Uh, around 8,000 years ago, the, the sea water gradually decreased. Uh, until about the 10th century, the evidence of the settlement was found in this area for the first time. However, this area is still a floodplain of Japaya Delta until today. Therefore, to settle down and form a city under the natural constraints, the adaptation to natural settings and human innovation as well as creation in Vaivarsa are needed. Ayutthaya can perhaps demonstrate both adaptation and innovation mm -hmm. through its urban planning, including water management system. That's the reason I, I uh, have chosen this uh, case study to share with you today. Let me introduce you to Ayutthaya in brief. It is now one of the 76 provinces of Thailand where it's located in Southeast Asian Peninsula as seen in this map. The city is about only 100 kilometers far from the mouth of its main river, Chao Phraya, uh, flowing southward to the Gulf of Thailand. In 1350, Siam Kingdom became dominant in Southeast Asia after the fall of Khmer Empire, as well as the Mon Kingdom, and flourished to 18th century, while Ayutthaya, its capital city, grew to be one of the world's largest and most cosmopolitan urban areas and a center of global diplomacy and commerce. The city was attacked and raised by the army of its neighboring kingdom who damaged the whole city and forced the, inhab in the inhabitants to leave the city in 1767. Ayutthaya was never rebuilt as a capital of Siam Kingdom in the same location and remains known today as an extensive archaeological site within a contemporary town. It is still unclear whether its water management system collapsed around that time or later on. In 1991, the historic city of Ayutthaya, where it is encircled by three rivers, partially was inscribed into the World Heritage List. Besides being recognized that it was a center of global diplomacy and commerce in 16th, 17th century, its traditional water management is also known as one of the most technological advanced systems in the world. Here is the aerial photograph of Ayutthaya at present. For Thai people, we call this urban area of Ayutthaya uh, City Island or Gok Meung. It looks like a, a, an island shaped by the, tree, uh, the river surrounding. The World Heritage Party is part of this city island. In 2011, the whole central plain of Thailand where Ayutthaya is located was severely flooded due to the impact from Nalinya, uh, many typhoons and uh, monsoons at that year. The amount of rainwater was much over expected for uh, our government as well as uh, people. While there were several other factors such as water flow blocking, improper urban planning, lack of flood risk preparedness and etc. If you look at the slide, the red dot above is the location of Ayutthaya, while uh, the bottom one is Bangkok. In consequences, the water management of the city plan of Thailand was failed. So the whole area, including the historic city of Ayutthaya was underwater for about four months. The loss and damages from 2011 flood was the worst in Thailand history, particularly in economic aspects, because the locations of many industrial estates situated around the city were floodplains in the past. This slide is showing an example of the impact to the country economy. It is a car factory which was completely flooded. 
these cars were demolished later on, while people who live in the city island were forced to evacuate. What came into my mind when I was developing disaster risk management for the historic city of Ayutthaya was how the water management of Ayutthaya was. Because from the Royal Chronicle, Ayutthaya ever suffered from different kinds of disasters such as outbreaks several times, as well as the battles with its neighboring states or kingdoms and the intervention from Westerners. But any catastrophic damages from flood had never been mentioned in its 400 years of history. Why it is known that the city is located in a flood plain, which is just about three to five meters above average sea level. As seen from various maps and records done by the Europeans who visited Ayutthaya during the 16th century, the city was strategical, uh, strategically established on an area surrounded by three rivers connecting the city to the sea. This location was chosen not too close to the sea in order to prevent the attack of the city by the seagoing warship of other nations, while the canal network was built to cover most part of the kingdom in order to connect the capital city with its colonies and facilitate the goods and wine products from the hinterland to the city. On the other hand, within the city island, the canal system, which was a main principal urban structure was constructed for several functions, including being a city mode, internal transportation, as well as drainage and irrigation systems. It is evident uh, that there were five main canals lying from north to south. Perhaps they were used to drain water during inundation period, when water flows from north to south naturally. On the other hand, the water was kept in the canals during dry season for internal transportation, connected by many sub-canals which were led east-west direction. Regarding the canal system within the city, Ayutthaya was also called by foreign visitors when it's of the east. Whereas the city wall, which was more than five meters height, functioned like the dike surrounding the city. Uh, as such, the flooding water perhaps was managed this way as uh, the studies so far. At present, only two of five main canals still exist, but they do not fully function, while less than 50% of sub-canals can still be seen or traced. Mm -hmm. However, they do not connect to each other because they are blocked by buildings or roads built in the recent periods. Some sub-canals become small ponds or a small water channels. Even though in 2011, these existing canals and water channels helped detaining water for half a day before the city island was completely flooded. This allowed people to be evacuated in time. As a member of a working group to develop disaster risk management of UTR, I kept proposing to restore or study and apply this knowledge to be one of the mitigation measures to make UTR more resilient Probably we may not be able to prevent the city from flood, but we can reduce the impact and damage made by flood in the future. Uh, before I finish uh, my presentation, I would like to show this picture. It's the south area of the city island where the confluence of two rivers surrounding the city island is. It can be seen that the temple in this picture was the only temple not being flooded in 2011. It is one of the oldest temple in Ayutthaya, which is still in use until today. When seeing this picture, I was wondering whether it was prepared for situating in the flood plains in the beginning. The further research may be needed, but anyway, at least its existence can prove that culture can help. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hataya, for giving this uh, illustrative example of the threats we face and, uh, and the learnings from the traditional wisdom and indigenous practices. So we now uh, open the floor for questions and I already have one in the chat box. 
which is open to, uh, to speakers who ever may wish to respond. And this is how it goes. What strategies work to convince climate and environment authorities to take account of local and traditional knowledge in climate planning? Uh, who would like to respond, please, since we are running a bit short on time? Okay, can I respond? Yes. All right, I think, well, this is just a very uh, quick response. Uh, how to convince the authorities to take account of local knowledge in terms of dealing with disaster or to, to change the policies. I think one strategy that I learned from experience is wait until the disaster struck. Okay, the Aceh war ends after the tsunami. And then, of course, um, this pandemic uh, will also um, will make people realize or the government realize that the resources may not be enough uh, if you don't try to look into the alternative resources. Um, if there is a water scarcity, energy scarcity, food scarcities, and even money scarcities, and how to deal with the survival of the nations. So probably the ideas about the uh, urban farming is about the recycling start to become a, a reality. So it's a pressure from nature. Uh, second is also a possibility of the, the pressure from the youth, the next generations. I do remember Greta, Greta Thunberg, and this small kid is trying to pressurize the government uh, to, to stop the problems with climate change. So the next generations is the, the right owner of the future of our planet, not our generations. So I think the, the pressure from the youth um, and through education, through um, uh, through um, uh, you know uh, actions, will be able to to hopefully to convince the, the authorities. And the third is the importance of organizations like uh, NGO, like like Seaja, like ASEF, like uh, Climate Heritage Network, to advise the governments, um, especially through the, for example, like organization of like like ASEAN. Um, during the summit or through the indirect uh, advisory and so on to the government uh, is help to help from, from the top. So we need to these three level of actions. One is the, from the bottom is the pressure from the community and the youth. From the top is through the global organizations and, and from the, the academics, the science itself. And third, I think is, uh, is from the nature itself. Okay, good. Uh, uh, I hope that satisfies the question asked by the, the one of the audience members. My next question is to, to, to the ambassador, His Excellency. Uh, how can cultural organizations connect their projects and suggest ideas to ASF for collaboration on the topic of culture and sustainability, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, indeed, well, as I said in my in my uh, intervention before, we are of course interested in uh, uh, working together with like-minded organizations, and we are open for suggestions. We have, of course, um, to see uh, how that can work into our programs. Uh, but the best way is, of course, always go via our uh, social media. But we are on all the social media present. So that is the best way to, to start a collaboration. But please bear in mind that uh, we are, as I also said, we are funded by, mainly funded by uh, our uh, partner governments. Uh, so we have then to look into uh, if, if there is an interesting idea how we could include that uh, in our programs. But we are certainly open uh, to look at everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you, His Excellency. Uh, if uh, Dr. Sherpa is still there, could I pose this question to you, please? Do you think there is enough dialogue and alignment between cultural actors and other actors working on climate change issues? Or do you think we are still working in silos? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the questions. 
um, the efforts of the dialogue and the discu discussion and discourse on the values of indigenous knowledge, cultural practices are already started along with the establishment of the indigenous peoples and local communities platform. As I share also in my presentations, as especially at the global level with the adoption of the, by the COP21 in Paris in 20, uh, 2015, uh, so that that has been like uh, you know historically uh, the uh, cry out of the indigenous people since 1994, after the two decades of the struggles, uh, the global level of the climate change discourse started being heard, and then also uh, like uh, the cultural heritage uh, network to invitation uh, to the platform as a uh, you know outside uh, the constituent bodies of the U.S. to invite in the discourse to deal with this. Uh, uh, issues and concerns of the indigenous peoples to the climate change resilience is already taken place. However, uh, you know, if you see uh, the replication of the global discourse at the national level, especially the policy of provision uh, at the national level, we hardly uh, so that also shows that uh, at least it started at the global level, but uh, it still need to be dealt at the national level because there's a way that matters because indigenous people on the local reality is uh, obviously the, uh, you know, it's uh, impacts of the uh, global, uh, national uh, policy and programs. So, uh, so th that need to be done and the platform is uh, already uh, in the process of enhancing the layers of platform in the regional and the national and the local level. So we are really hopeful that uh, it will have a implications uh, to deal with the issues and concerns of the indigenous people's uh, discourse and dialogue at the national level and ultimately local level to understand how the indigenous people has been contributing for climate change resilience and uh, to deal with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shepa. And my final question, since we are running really short of time, uh, is to Hathaya. Uh, uh, there is a question, Hathaya, which is uh, inquiring that some of the disasters uh, uh, you know, they have uh, the location, the geographical location of a city, town, site plays a key role. And, and the intangible values or wisdom in the community has taken over years several measures to deal with that. Uh, so do you have any, any uh, thoughts on the cities that, are, that will be in the future facing these threats or are vulnerable? Uh, due to their geographical location, simply you can't move them, they are just there. Uh, so would you have any thoughts on that, please? Yeah, I, actually, I think, uh, as you said, we cannot move, but actually, once, I think a few years ago, we have a big challenge uh, to move the capital city to the other location. But actually, it, it's just the, the idea, but uh, difficult to implement. But actually, I think the uh, the main uh, issues for uh, this kind of uh, problem, I think, uh, particularly for uh, Thailand, come from the problem in urban planning. Because actually, if we, you look at the case study in UTR, when people start uh, forming the city, I think they really understand the natural setting of the cities and know how to uh, live with uh, water, how, do, how, how they can manage flooding. But uh, right now, uh, the whole national systems already changed. And actually, whenever uh, any new uh, urban planning comes, it really uh, does not include the, uh, the knowledge about uh, natural uh, condition of uh, the cities. So I think uh, it's really important to make the, uh, the involving organization and peoples to understand uh, the importance of the interrelation between the city and uh, its nature. So I think this is one of the, fundament the fundamental uh, ideas that should be in place for uh, the future of the city in this kind of condition. Thank you so much. And uh, really exciting, very stimulating discussion that we've had uh, this afternoon with all our uh, eminent speakers joining in from different parts of uh, the world. And I'm really grateful that you took time out and were able to connect and contribute the vast knowledge and experience that you all have in your own domains. Thank you very much. We will be closing this session now and wish you the uh, uh, enjoyable rest of the day. We now uh, move on to something very exciting, which is primarily for the audiences. And 
uh, I will now invite uh, uh, Elfie, who is going to be running this, uh, this segment. It is called Slido Poll. And he will, in a minute, explain to you what Slido Poll and how does it work. It basically is that we ask you a question and you will be typing in a word or a very short phrase, and then we'll do a cloud uh, arrangement of, of this. And, and the question is that, how do you think arts, culture, and heritage can support the race to zero? And I hand it over to Alfie now to guide you through on how to work this. Thank you, Alfie. a short phrase and whatever comes to your mind in a couple of seconds we will close it in a minute and then we will see you know what are the critical thoughts that are coming in which will be really helpful for the chn network and all of us who are working here on your phones or on your computers, you can log into slido.com and then there is a code or a password. You feed that in and you'll be able to enter your comments, your thoughts into the box, which Alfie is very kindly collating. Thirty seconds more to go. Please carry on. You can see a lot more our audiences are locked in. So please just carry on. Keep sending in your thoughts. Twenty seconds. <laughs> That's really exciting and promising. Just carry, go on, carry on. <laughs> Keep using your instruments in your hands and share what is there in your head. 10 seconds. Okay, so uh, Alfie, can I please request you for the results, please? Great, so you see how uh, uh, the phrases and the, and, and, and the little uh, thoughts that you had in your mind have been collated in the cloud and you see how this becomes helpful for the further work of CHN and, and take these learnings ahead uh, in planning our uh, future directions. Thank you very much. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed this segment. It's just to warm you up and make sure you aren't uh, sleeping or going off for tea, <laughs> coffee, lunches, etc. And you are able to use your phones and mobiles and technology effectively. Well, so we now move on to our next session, which is a round table. And to conduct the roundtable, I invite uh, Dr. Darren, who is joining us from uh, Australia. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Trust of South Australia, based in Adelaide. Uh, the Trust is the leading non-government heritage conservation and advocacy organization in the state, managing more than 120 heritage properties. Darren has worked for a range of heritage, cultural, and environmental organizations in Australia, Europe, and North America in management and consulting roles, including cultural institutions, government and not-for-profit organizations. For 10 years, he led a private consulting practice advising organizations around the world on strategies 
for utilizing new digital technologies. He is particularly interested in the transformative possibilities of digital technologies in promoting heritage awareness and engagement. He holds a number of degrees in humanities and in management, including a PhD in business. His doctoral research investigated organizational innovation in cultural organizations through the use of digital technologies. When not advocating for conservation of heritage and nature, he is usually found outside enjoying it. Uh, he is also uh, my co-chair for this event, and uh, I will take your leave. I'll be uh, on the on the event, but now I hand it over to Darren to lead the rest of the event. And after his session, he will kindly hand it over to Elizabeth, who will be pres presenting her closing remarks. And hopefully, we should uh, we should catch up on the loss of 10, 12 minutes that we had and finish it off in at the right time. Thank you so much for all your help, cooperation, and engagement. Over to Darren, please. Thank you, Nevin. Um, it's my great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, we are really short of time, and I think the, the round table is really a chance for two of our guests to really enter into a conversation about some of these issues we've started to talk about. Um, so I'm not going to um, give the full introduction to our two speakers. You can read their biographies. Um, they're very impressive biographies on the program page. But I will just introduce, um, firstly, Amarasa Gala, um, who is a distinguished academic. I met him before in other capacities in Australia, but he's certainly um, got a, a fine record, both in the museums and cultural heritage spaces, um, an extensive publication record. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say on this topic. Also, um, we're joined by Rosie Paul. Now, Rosie is an architect uh, and she's formerly with the um, Oroville Earth Institute as the UNESCO representative for Earth and Architecture South Asia. Um, she's now uh, one of the founders and leaders of Masons Inc, which is a practice trying to break stereotypes and push the boundaries empowering women in the construction sector. So two very interesting people to talk around these issues. The topic for the round table is creative design, art and cultural heritage as decarbonisation pathways for cities and buildings. I'm sure both of our guests have thought about this topic. I'm going to offer them each uh, seven minutes to start the conversation, and then we'll try and have a bit of an interchange before we have to wrap up. We don't have a lot of time, so I'd rather get started. So I might uh, welcome Rosie first to um, talk on that topic for a grand total of seven minutes. Over to you, Rosie. Hello, everyone. A real pleasure to um, be here today and um, a real honor to be also speaking with all of you uh, real rock stars, I would say, in the uh, race to zero. Um, since I don't have much time and I also feel discussion is important, um, let me just get right on. Uh, today, I, I would be speaking about, um, you know, the past forward looking into exactly looking into everything that was discussed earlier on the importance of using the wisdom of communities to um, um, you know to face the challenges of the present and the future now uh, the construction industry uh, being one of the major contributors uh, contributors to carbon emissions I must say um, at Masons Inc we feel that it is, um, our responsibility to try and reduce um, the emissions that you know our buildings produce and uh, what we try and do is uh, try to find ways to inspire from tradition um, so that we can use it in our buildings and promote alternate construction techniques um, that help this cause as well. Now um, I spoke about the industry being one of the major contributors to uh, emissions now looking at the culprit, one of the culprits that can't go, uh, uh, you know, not mentioned is uh, the use of cement. Uh, unfortunately, cement has uh, managed to creep into almost uh, every uh, phase or every 
um, kind of construction activity today. And uh, really what uh, I feel uh, we need to focus on is to see and find an alternative uh, to this product, uh, which, is, uh, which has such a negative impact on, on the environment. So um, what we believe at Mason Zinc is that innovation doesn't necessarily come from um, you know, inventing new materials, but you know, it could also, the answer could also lie in the reinvention of traditional materials, et cetera. So today I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk to you about this research that we conducted in finding alternatives to cement uh, by looking at traditional practices and um, you know, the wisdom of the communities that exist already. Now coming to uh, the region, the region that was studied was uh, the region of Kerala, which is the southern state of India. And of course, the research was done such that we uh, spoke to various people. Um, you know, I spoke earlier about the wisdom of community. So it really involved going to different areas and talking to people to understand how was, you know, construction done earlier. Um, you know, as we all know, mud and other natural building materials were the main um, materials in construction. But also there are certain uh, natural additives that were added to these materials to make them more durable that have been forgotten over the course of time. So uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the, this uh, research was done for around three years. And what we found is even in the tiny state of Kerala compared to when you think of India or even when you think of Asia, we already found, uh, you know, about 25 alternatives to um, uh, the stabilizer that's being used right now. I will, and uh, what was also interesting to see is that, um, you know, depending on the region that they came from or the region that they were building, um, the, the kind of additive that was used was also changing. For instance, in areas where there are lots of forests and mountains, the additives used were more towards the vegetal side, uh, uh, you know, taking from plants and trees. Uh, and when it came to the fields or, uh, you know, the, um, the plains where you have rivers and rivulets, it took from, uh, I think earlier on in the presentation, there was uh, this thing of rice being the source of life. And it's interesting also to see how rice had uh, played a feature even in building construction. It's not very often that we, uh, you know, look at that or think about that. I'll come to that a little later. Now, just uh, since we don't have much time, I'll just quickly take you through one or two ingredients that I, I really think you would benefit from just knowing that there's so much treasure in uh, traditional practices and traditional knowledge. So th this is a freshwater fish found in the, in the backwaters of Kerala. The local name is Varal. And uh, what was done during building construction uh, was that they, these fish were made to swim in a separate container and the mucus that they produced while they swam in it was taken and used uh, uh, to make the mud mixes, which, was, which uh, then became the buildings or the walls of, of their houses. So, um, and, and it's also nice to know that after the use, the fish were put back into the, uh, into, in, into the sea, um, I mean, into the um, river, but maybe they were also eaten for dinner. Uh, we don't know <laughs> the de details. Uh, but it was a nice um, thing to think about. Uh, and uh, when we come to, this is another nut that is found. Uh, it's called a gal nut uh, in English and uh, otherwise locally known as kaduka, where, uh, you know, the water from this, once it's put in water, the water later on after a few days was taken and uh, mixed into the, in, into the mud. And uh, it, it it uh, kind of enhances the mud and gives it water resistive uh, properties. Now, um, this is an interesting creeper that when cut and put in water, the water almost immediately changes its consistency to an egg white consistency. Again, when added into uh, lime or mud, it uh, you know, slowed down the drying process, which in turn reduced shrinking and uh, reduced the cracks as well. Now coming to rice, since rice was, I think, this kind of the central theme, kind of tying all the, all the presentations together. Um, rice is a staple of Kerala, and um, it was interesting to see how the water that, were, that the rice was boiled in 
was also used in mixing along with uh, mud or lime to again uh, improve the you know mechanical properties and uh, also the wa water resistive qualities of uh, of the building material uh, apart from this uh, even the husk of the rice grain was used um, the the straw from the rice and the husk was later on burnt uh, and the ash from it was used uh, as a final plaster mix etc so just looking at how these examples uh, were put to use here we see some pretty images of how they were actually um, you know applied and what the final aesthetic was this uh, was a particular um, community that used uh, mud in their houses. The construction was done with mud and bamboo, but there were certain additives added to it, such as um, rice husk, as I said earlier, the ash of the husk in, in the final uh, coat. And interestingly, also um, a very local um, available plant is the hibiscus, and the leaves of that were taken and uh, uh, put in water to get a soapy mix, which was used as a kind of polish, which really helped in the water resistive properties of the house. As you know, Kerala is, um, has a very tropical climate. We have, uh, we experience rains for about uh, at least six months in a year. So it was very important that whatever material that was used in construction is able to withstand these kind of rains. And these examples show that uh, these are tried and tested. Now, this is uh, another example where the ash, the that I was talking of earlier is done as the final um, final layer of plastering, which again helps in its water resistive uh, properties. A simple flooring example as well, where here the mix is uh, cow dung. Cow dung is another uh, another additive that is still being used quite popularly all across India. Um, no different in Kerala as well, where cow dung was mixed with mud and the final a finish of the floor is uh, polished with the hibiscus liquid that I was talking about. Um, very few examples as I didn't want to take up too much time. Uh, what was interesting to see is that these ingredients not only uh, uh, stayed within these small heritage uh, that we, which we saw examples of small houses and hamlets, it also translated to large structures such as temples, um, the picture that you see on the extreme right is um, the temple, Vadakanathan temple in Trishur, where it used about 14 different herbs in their lime plastering. And um, uh, it was recently uh, conserved and um, it, it, it is just uh, really excellent, the, the quality of work. Well, another interesting fact, uh, since we spoke about different silos and how they uh, you know, how they remain in their silos and don't interact with one another. It was interesting to see that um, traditionally these silos didn't exist because it was, uh, uh, knowledge was shared and this was evident when we saw that the same ingredients that were used in architecture were also used in Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a uh, traditional medicine of Kerala and in uh, traditional mural art as well. So we see that um, earlier these, uh, these things didn't exist and somehow as we progressed, uh, things changed and it has kind of affected us adversely, I would um, say. Can I, can I interrupt you there, yes. Rosie? Yes. Um, uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time. Is there, is there any last point you'd like to make before we hand over to Professor Geller? Yes, I'm, uh, uh, I'm at the end of the, uh, this thing, so we're, we're good. Okay. Um, Thank you. It's very, yeah. very fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask Professor Gala now to give us his thoughts on these topics. I've heard some fantastic ideas and practices from Rosie. So I'd welcome your thoughts now, Professor Gala. Thank you, Darren. And uh, what a wonderful series of speakers and so much to learn from all of them. Uh, seven minutes, I've got seven points. Uh, okay. The first one, and, and it's very much an autoethnographic a reflection on my life of 43 years, most of which was spent in Australia, Denmark, and South Africa. Now I live in India, in the world heritage city of Ahmedabad. Uh, first thing is that 1985-86, when I was the national director of affirmative action for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders in the cultural sector, one of the first things we did with Australian national parks 
is run a capacity build, one year pro capacity building program for 32 uh, Aboriginal people with the Gagaju Association and Kakuta National Park. These are some of the first Indigenous people to be employed in the cultural sector, in the parks, and so on. Uh, what the main outcome of this from our point of view here is that they stronger brought in the idea that nature culture dichotomy is alien, it's imposed, uh, it's not indigenous, and that if you want to, for example, manage the fire management regimes, you have to take indigenous knowledge into consideration. So the conservation plan of Kakuta National Park was transformed and changed, taking the indigenous knowledge into consideration. And, uh, and this is very important for us because all the cities were surrounded last year uh, across Eastern Australia with fire rings with uh, devastating bushfires and where Darren lives, you know, sort of it's uh, uh, Adelaide is known for its bushfires, especially Adelaide Hills. And uh, so indigenous knowledge is being increasingly acknowledged as part of not only climate crisis, but also black matter, black lives matter discourse. My second point is that uh, based on this notion of that creativity is critical in engaging with climate change, Australia Council for the Arts uh, and especially the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Arts Board has launched a range of initiatives, especially with advocating for the Resilience Fund and where the artists are actually dealing with uh, indigenous artists are dealing with the intersection uh, with uh, climate crisis and contemporary lives with COVID-19 and, and their own knowledge systems. That's the second thing. The third thing I want to mention is uh, I was very privileged to uh, work on and co-convene as a, I'm still the founding trustee at the Pacific Island Museums Association. Uh, we Australians are part of the Pacific and it's uh, very much part of our uh, ambit of our work. And one of the important things that uh, uh, PIMA, as it is known, adopted is a code of ethics, uh, uh, chaired and drafted by Ralph Reganwano from Vanuatu, who is now Minister for Law, and I think he's Deputy Prime Minister of Vanuatu. And he was at that time the director of the Vanuatu Cultural Center. And uh, uh, it very much emphasizes the non-binary, but as part of the code of ethics, uh, if you Google PIMA code of ethics, P-I-M-A, you'll, you'll get that. The fourth point I want to make is yeah, coming back to India itself uh, with World Bank support and Indira Gandhi, Rashtri, Mana Sangrali and Bhopal convened a phenomenal uh, one week conference where you could present your papers through ceremony, ritual, uh, or uh, a song uh, focusing on sacred groves. Uh, a number of cities in India are overtaking the sacred groves, and the knowledge that's there with, in these sacred groves is critical. For example, uh, where Rosie was talking about Kerala, uh, Kochi uh, is a good example where it's overtaken a number of sacred groves. And Kaladi University is doing something about it to document this traditional knowledge and rehabilitate it. My next fifth point is uh, uh, when I was working as uh, doing an evaluating in China, in Quezhou province with the, um, uh, uh, with the indigenous people there, one of the things I learned is China adopted the notion of ecological civilization. It's a national priority policy called ecological civilization, and uh, that everything is informed by a conservation ethic, whether it's nature or culture across China. As it is also integrated into the two year national tourism policy that was launched two years ago, which is localized. My sixth thing that I want, sixth point that I want to make, Darren, is uh, India has just launched a, an amazing national educational policy. And uh, as part of this policy, I'm part of a group of seven people working with Northeastern India, which is 90% indigenous people. And uh, uh, you're a humanities person, Darren, so you, you know, in Australia we're decimating humanities, but in India, it's going to get 400% increase in funding. And we building on it in the next 40 years to bring, you know, to 
engage and uh, empower indigenous knowledge systems to be at the forefront in the university system in the Northeast. And my seventh and last point there is I was privileged to work uh, in, uh, in uh, live and work in Denmark for four and a half years in Copenhagen, during which time I hosted and chaired an international research network conference on sustainable development dealing with uh, the issue of carbon neutrality. And uh, uh, so about five years ago, Copenhagen was the European Union's green city and, uh, and it launched uh, the uh, 2025 strategy for Copenhagen to be carbon neutral. And once again, it's taken global knowledge into consideration, not just Nordic and Danish knowledge. And the research conference was, I was very lucky to have Skandik Copenhagen to sponsor it. So the five-star network actually challenged us to evaluate and assess their practices in the cities, how they are being becoming carbon neutral. So Skandi Copenhagen uh, was found to be carbon neutral, and this is the way of the future. So there are many ways of reaching that goal of, you know, that, that race to zero. I just wanted to share some reflections based on my 43 years in the profession. Thank you, Dara. Thank you so much, Emma. That's um, a fantastic um, and very succinct summary of an uh, extraordinary career. Um, I think in the time we've got, um, what strikes me from your two presentations is that what we may be talking about is the nature of knowledge, that um, basically we're talking about, you know, the particularity of local knowledge, the importance of traditional knowledge, the knowledge constructs that we may be bringing from different cultures. I wonder if you'd both like to, um, maybe I'll ask Rosie to go first, to maybe sum up what you think about the, the importance of knowledge and how we might actually rethink knowledge, reuse knowledge in the quest um, to re reduce carbon. Rosie, would you like to take that challenge to maybe look at the way knowledge can be used towards that challenge? Yes, I think the, the key here is to not um, look uh, outside, uh, or I would say not only look outside for knowledge, but also to look within. As um, uh, in the case of India, I, I see many times, you know, we look towards the West, or we look towards uh, the outside to see what is the newest thing coming in, what is the most innovative thing happening, um, and I think when we do that, we tend to lose out on the knowledge that already exists. And it's sad that um, because of our lack of attention into these areas, um, the, the local or traditional know-how is uh, uh, dying. And um, it, I'm so happy to hear all the different organizations and um, you know, working towards the revival of these and you know, working towards uh, the fact that these survive um, these challenging times. So I would just like to say that I think that already there is, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel again. It already exists. The answers already exist. We just need to look in the right place and, uh, you know, we would find it. Th thank you. That's a fantastic summary. Uh, last word to you, Amar. Would you like to um, maybe talk about what you think the knowledge challenge is? I, I'm totally with Rosie on what she said, and uh, whether it's India, uh, whether it's Australia, uh, I think we need to decolonize uh, knowledge systems. As Rosie pointed out, you know, sort of not understanding, appreciating the local knowledge systems. Uh, and if we do, we can make use of the best of indigenous and local knowledge systems and the best that the world has to offer. Now, this is the same thing in Australia too. Uh, you know, I remember 25, 30 years ago, all kinds of projects, you know, appropriate housing, you know, like from Adelaide there, you know, was launched in Alice Springs. And, uh, but there's a lot of knowledge, but in Australia, uh, we have a wonderful writer who lives in London, Clive James. He wrote a book called, uh, you know, Cultural Amnesia. And I think both in Australia and India, one of the things apart from decolonization we have to deal with is our cultural amnesia. And, and as Rosie said, 
look within and uh, and look without too but uh, bring out the best thank you thank very you, much Dan. thank you um, delightful to hear from both of you and i hope that the people who've been joining us today have got some food for thought that they can take away for their own situations so i have to call this part of the session to a halt um, i thank both our speakers and now i'm going to hand over to elizabeth erosito um, for the closing remarks. Elizabeth uh, is the director of the National Trust of Fiji, a member of the executive committee for the International National Trust Organization alongside me. And she's recently been appointed as the co-chair for the Climate Heritage Network for the Asia Pacific region, um, the people behind today's event. Um, I am going to let Elizabeth now sum up the day and uh, conclude proceedings. Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Darren. Well, this has been quite an exciting um, and very rich dialogue. And I really just want to thank the conveners for such an excellent and well-prepared event. Um, thank you as well to all the presenters for the very rich and diverse array of uh, thought-provoking, presentations. We've had a chance to listen, to share stories, um, to hear about our communities on the ground. And this has just reinforced to us the role that arts, culture and heritage can play in achieving a climate resilient world. Um, we also um, listened to Dr. Sherpa who reinforced the dynamics of indigenous populations in climate change. 6% of the global population indigenous people, approximately 70 in Asia. And these are at high risk from COVID-19 because of prevalent factors of inequalities in health, discrimination in many forms. To this, we have the complexities of uh, climate change and this destabilizes the systems that our indigenous people have set up and have used uh, traditionally to manage events such as disasters or pandemics. And the end results are vulnerable societies. As I drive to work each day, I pass through mangrove groves, coastal roads, an extension of the city's coastline. And I am reminded each day that we are on the front line of climate change. With each passing day, Pacific Island peoples are at risk of being displaced, of being relocated, or they choose to migrate their families and their communities for their safety and their future security. A recent study by Robert Oakes in 2019 across the countries of Kiribati, Tuvalu and, um, and Nauru show that the reasons for and the perceived outcomes of moving can't be separated. Our culture, our spiritual link, our physical link to the land and the sea all influence our decision-making and the movement of peoples in response to climate change. People must be at the forefront of such decision-making so that there is a clear understanding of the climate impacts and their responses to the challenges. Culture and heritage stand for creativity, for reuse, for stewardship, and for planning with a multi-generational time. Our approaches are the approaches of climate action and of the circular economy. When we find the win-win, the co-benefits, the culture-based strategies can put us on the path to where we want to go, climate resilient development and sustainable development. We can fight poverty, we can tackle climate change, 
we can um, be happy. We can achieve that balance as our colleague from Thailand presented today. And with these very short words, I just wish to again, thank all the presenters, thank the conveners, and wish you all a very blessed evening. Thank you.